Well, hello there, everybody, and welcome to another episode of The Dry Dock. Let's get on with the questions, and let's try and get this list down to a little bit of a more manageable size. Santiago Trujillo Tobon asks me to confirm or deny an incident that occurred in the 1930s. Uh, well, rather than go through the rest of the question, I think we'll just tell the story of the incident, because it is actually true. So, the setting is Bermuda, that lovely sunny island in the Caribbean and King George V has just died, which puts us in 1936. And as with any good Royal Navy base, Bermuda is defended by a number of shore guns. So, in honour of the late dearly departed King, the St David's Battery in Bermuda is ordered to fire a 70-gun salute, one shot for each year of the King's life. Well, so far so good, you might think. I mean... Firing saluting shots and things like that is part of everyday life on a naval base, surely. And yes, you'd be correct. However, Bermuda's environment is very hot and humid, and it was proving very difficult to store ammunition there. As a result, the battery was supplied with the minimum amount of ammunition, so that it could be replenished with fresh ammunition fairly regularly as they expended it. Now, for regular salutes and things like that, you don't need that much blank ammunition. For a 70-gun salute, or a rather a 70-shot continuous salute, you need a lot more shells. The battery only had 23 blanks. Never mind, they thought. We've got a bunch of live ammunition and we need to expend it anyway. And no ships are due in. Uh, let's just crank this thing right up to maximum elevation and we'll just chuck shells into the sea where it can't harm anyone apart from a few local fish. Right? Right? Enter the Colombian destroyer Antioquia, which was merrily making its way towards Bermuda for a well-deserved stay in the friendly British port. Now, you can imagine just how surprised this destroyer was to suddenly find itself on the receiving end of an eight-minute continuous live artillery barrage from a fort of an ostensibly friendly base. The gunners, of course, having already decided that there was nobody out to sea to worry about, weren't even bothering to look and were just lopping shells continuously, so the poor old destroyer had to found itself in the unenviable situation of having to dodge a continuous stream of live fire, which fortunately they managed to do, and an international incident was avoided. Um, Santiago there was asking me to confirm if that incident occurred, and I did a fair bit of research, um, hence why it's taken a while to actually answer the question, but going back through Bermudan historical documents, this incident is actually attested to all the way back pretty much to the time it actually happened. So, yeah, it didn't happen, and there you go everyone, a little known incident where Britain almost accidentally declared war on Colombia by sinking one of their destroyers. Diane Turner asks, Do records exist of any debate amongst World War II-era Kriegsmarine officers concerning the use of their mightiest and most modern capital ships as surface raiders rather than as essential fleet elements? There is some, and uh, obviously there were some officers who weren't particularly keen on seeing sort of Shan Horse and Bismarck-class vessels used effectively as fleet raiders when converted commercial ships were doing just as well, if not better. But honestly, a lot of them were very aware of exactly who they worked for and the fact that unless they showed themselves to be useful in some way that Hitler found convincing, they were probably going to be on the chopping block. Well, either them or possibly their ships. And uh, this almost happened a few times when Hitler was convinced that their Kriegsmarine was useless. So it was probably, for most officers, a case of, well, they'd much rather be doing sort of the actual military thing of fighting but there was a certain degree of military utility in raiding the enemy's shipping, and they knew full well that if they just sat around waiting to build up their strength for a theoretical confrontation with the British fleet, they'd probably be scrapped long before they actually got to that point. So it was a case of do what you can with the situation that you're in. K. Wolfax asks, why did the US Navy stick with the standard battleship design after the end of the First World War, when the Queen Elizabeth class demonstrated that well-armoured and faster battleships were possible? Even Bayern and Baden were a little faster than the American standard design. It seems to me that the US Navy saddled themselves with capital ships that could neither chase a retreating enemy or escape if they were outnumbered. Now, this is true to an extent. I mean, we look at the, well, the Lexington's a battle cruiser, so they don't really count, but look at the uh, South Dakota 1920s design, and it did get a little bit faster. Um, but 
Kaywolf is right there with, uh, to a certain degree, in that after the Queen Elizabeth class's debut at the beginning of the First World War, uh, most of the American standards were actually built after that, and they all stuck to this 21 knot top speed. Now, as for why, there are a number of reasons. Um, part of that, to be fair, was probably down to the fact that the British went back to the R class afterwards, which were albeit faster than the American standards, um, they were not that much faster. The, tw the Royal Navy aimed for a 23 knot uh, speed battle line as opposed to the American 21, and 2 knot speed difference wasn't that much. Secondly was that to increase speed you need a lot more power once you hit the sort of 20 knot plus region, and to plug in uh, the kind of power plant that would have been needed to propel a standard class without sacrificing firepower or armor to any great extent you would have needed a ship that cost a lot more money and congress at the time remember was probably the number one enemy of the u.s navy and therefore to go back to them and say actually we want a lot more expensive ships and what can they do well they can go a little bit faster that would possibly have been a good way to get ships cancelled and of course once you've actually got a significant number of standards built trying to build a small fast division isn't actually really worth it. The whole point of the standards was that they all sailed at the same speed, they could sail in formation without having to worry too much about station keeping. Um, so once you've got sort of six or eight of them out, you might as well just keep the rest of them at the same speed and hope that as a combined fleet, um, just through sheer numbers, you should be able to outmatch, outmatch sorry, anybody that you come across. And to be fair, at the time, um, by the time the standards were completed and you're onto the Colorados, pretty much the only forces you had to worry about were uh, the British, because the Japanese uh, didn't have anywhere near as many modern battleships. And as I said, the British uh, standard battleship line up to the mid-20s envisaged a 23-knot top speed uh, battleship force. Which, uh, yeah, okay, the standards couldn't run away from it, and they couldn't force a closure, um, but the speed difference wasn't too bad. Um, so it was kind of a... might as well go with it at that point, um, because it would cost too much to remedy. Autumn Ewell Nashoba, I think, says, um, Could you look at the possibility of the Imperial Japanese Navy moving to a destroyer-based naval fleet after their experience in World War One as part of the Anglo-Japanese Alliance? Now... It's relatively easy looking back, especially through the lens of World War II and the effectiveness of the Long Lance Torpedo, to think, well, maybe if Japan had just thrown massive amounts of funding into flooding the world with destroyers armed with Long Lances, they would have made a pretty lethal fleet. However, there are a few issues with that, which obviously the Japanese also appreciated. The primary one is cruisers. And although battleships are not the world's best at, uh, dis at killing destroyers before they get in torpedo range, cruisers are very good at killing destroyers. And if your fleet is made up of destroyers and just destroyers, then your opponents will end up building things uh, like the Atlantas uh, or other cruisers such as that. I mean, not that the Atlantis was specifically designed as destroyer killers, but the kind of cruiser with a mass number of uh, fast-firing lighter guns would just pr proliferate, and yeah, okay, you could torpedo them, fair enough, um, but any half-decent uh, cruiser captain who is uh, captaining something like an Atlanta or some uh, specific destroyer killing derivative thereof um, would have made mincemeat of and quite a number of destroyers, and with the American... Uh, industrial advantage, the Americans might have been able to churn out Atlanta-type destroyer killers in as large numbers as the Japanese could turn out destroyers. Uh, and the Japanese perfectly aware of this um, and realized they did need capital ships to try and stand off against enemy capital ships, uh, and that's why they didn't transition over to a destroyer fleet. Tamenga88 asks, how do you do laundry and dry it on ships that have a crew that numbers over a thousand? The reason he asks is he saw a photo of Der Flinger or Hindenburg with large blankets draped over its railings whilst in port, but you can't really do this while at sea, can you? Well, um, the answer is, or can you? I mean, if you're at sea during peacetime, there's not really a lot that prevents you sticking a bunch of uh, clothes on lines and such all over the ship, and uh, capital ships and such 
tend to have a lot of places you could run lines to and from. Um, and since they're cruising around at sort of 15, 16 knots, they even generate their own useful breeze to dry everything in. Um, but obviously the weather is not always that clement, and in wartime uh, that's usually not really possible. Um, the answer basically comes from the fact that ships have a very large power plant, and that power plant generates an awful lot of heat, and that heat has to go up through the ship somewhere well, via the funnels, so there are... Um, places on the ship where it's naturally quite warm you can put plate things to dry there and if you really need to obviously you can uh, duct some of that heat away to keep things uh, warm dry and ready to go so yeah laundry on ships um, just use the uh, latent heat of the massive great furnaces you've got underneath Tamenga88 also asks uh, why didn't the British come up with a standardized secondary caliber gun for battleships cruisers and main guns for destroyers by World War II. Uh, you have the 4-inch, the 4.5-inch, the 4.7-inch, and the 5.25-inch, and to make it more complicated, some of those guns are different caliber lengths um, with breech-loading and quick-firing flavors. It must have wreaked havoc with ammunition logistics. Why didn't they just take the American approach of one caliber size and stick with it? Well, that's a very good question, actually. Um, some of it comes down to the method of loading. Um, the 5-inch 38 had a semi-automated loading procedure that meant that the slightly heavier shell could be used um, on destroyers without too much problem. Also, the fact that American destroyers, because they were designed, obviously, to operate with fleets that were mainly concerned with operating over the Pacific, tended to be slightly larger than contemporary British destroyers, which meant they could take a slightly heavier gun, um, which made the choice of the 5-inch a little bit more uh, realistic. And at that point, the 5-inch kind of then prol proliferated. The British did try to manufacture their own 5-inch gun, but for various reasons the program was a failure. Now, the biggest problem that you had at the time was that most people would use either 4-inch or near enough, um, or 6-inch guns, or near enough. Obviously you had 5.9s, 6.1s, 3.9s, 4.1s, depending on whether the country in question was using imperial measurements or metric. And ideally, you would want something like a 6-inch gun, because it hits a lot harder than a 4-inch gun, um, which is why secondary batteries on capital ships tended to use the 6-inch gun uh, quite a bit. Where, But the problem there was that the 6-inch gun's ammunition was either too heavy to for a single person to load and fire, especially in rough seas uh, on a destroyer, or it came in two parts, which made it more complicated, whereas a 4-inch gun, the ammunition could come in a single um, cartridge and one person could load and fire it, which made it a lot easier and quicker to use. So in, on quick-firing guns on destroyers, you definitely needed that. And obviously the quick, the 4-inch was a lot, lot lighter, so you could actually fit them on destroyers without making them ridiculously oversized. The only downside of the 4-inch gun was that its explosive stopping power was just not that great. So the reason you see 4.5s, 4.7s and 5.25s is basically a constant attempt to try and up the calibre of the guns and therefore up the firepower without putting too much of a strain on the crew. And at various points, it's sort of like, oh, well, maybe this shell that's a couple of pounds heavier can be worked. Maybe not. Okay, we'll try a different caliber. Um, and also just different uses. I mean, the 4.7s were generally designed initially for anti-aircraft use. Uh, the 4.5s came in more as a way of trying to up the just up the firepower on destroyers. The 5.25s were an attempt to do a dual-purpose anti-aircraft and anti-shipping gun that was mounted on battleships where they're in turrets so in theory again it should be easier to use the ammunition um it's basically lots of different attempts to provide the ideal solution to lots of different problems and as the old saying goes uh, perfect is the enemy of good enough the americans with the five inch 38 sort of went well it's good enough to do all of the roles, so let's do that. The British sort of got into this little bit of a groove where they were trying to provide the perfect gun for a destroyer, the perfect gun for anti-aircraft, the perfect gun for a battleship secondary, etc, etc. So they ended up with this whole wide proliferation of uh, weapons. That said, the pattern wasn't quite as disjointed as it might otherwise look. The 4-inch gun was very much a relic holdover from World War One and was most often seen on the older warships. 
and on destroyers and such built in the interwar period. It was also a half-decent anti-aircraft weapon and was used in that role quite a bit. Now, once you got into the later um, period shipping, sort of uh, the mid-1930s and onwards, you saw this upgrade to the 4.7-inch, um, which was actually quite a good um, anti-shipping weapon. In fact, I'd venture to say it's possibly as an anti-shipping gun, um, possibly even better than the 5-inch 38, but significantly worse anti-aircraft use um, and then as the war progressed uh, things kind of dropped back a bit to the 4.5 inch uh, which you started seeing towards the end of the war uh, on lots of uh, refits and such and that 4.5 inch gun uh, stayed kind of in service out past the second world war and modified versions of it are still in service with the royal navy today because they kind of settled on that as their ideal weight of gun for secondary batteries for larger ships and primary armament for smaller ships. So basically the Royal Navy did get to standardization eventually with a 4.5 inch gun like the Americans, it just took them 10-15 years longer. Naomi Claire NL asks, um, have you done or can you do a video about the group of protected cruisers known as Ellswick cruisers? Uh, what made them stand out for instance that even today we know them by that name rather than the various classes? Well. Yes, we can, and we will do, but just to cover off a few details quickly here in a couple of minutes, uh, the Ellswick cruisers were all built and designed by Armstrong at their Ellswick shipyards, mostly for export, even though Armstrong was a UK-based company, and effectively they set the path, f uh, the evolutionary path for modern cruisers um, way back in the 1800s, because the firepower of ships had been increasing to the point that to armour a ship, even against cruiser-grade guns, required so much weight of belt armour um, that the cruiser-type, sort of fast commerce raiding, fleet protection, scout, etc., was in danger of going extinct just because you couldn't get armour, speed, and guns all in the same hull without being stupidly large and expensive, at which point you might as well build a battleship. And the Ellswick cruisers solved that problem uh, by introducing what would later become known as the Protected Cruiser, um, which obviously, as I say, we will cover elsewhere in more detail later. Sar Jim asks, why was the Vanguard completed? Uh, the US had cancelled Montana in 1943, so it seems pretty clear that the day of the battleship was over by 1944, uh, when work resumed on her. Given Britain's financial condition in 46, why commission a ship whose usefulness uh, was demonstrated by the fact she only remained in commission for nine years? The Royal Navy already had four reasonably modern battleships in the King George V class, so why one more? I suppose national pride is one answer, but do you know for, of other reasons? Well, part of it, and possibly the simplest part, was the fact that the work on Vanguard had advanced to a point where you would have lost more money stopping construction and breaking it all up for no result than you would have got by finishing her, which was one thing. <laughs> so there was that. Um, second was that, although in retrospect it might seem that the day of the battleship was over by 44, that wasn't necessarily seen as the case at the time. Um, certainly in the UK there was a lot of uh, talk about and uh, designs for potentially trying to design a battleship that could survive the threats of uh, what was then the modern era, sort of big guided bombs and aircraft and things like that. And in that respect, her main gun bat turrets aside, Vanguard would have been a useful stepping stone between the sort of pre-war King George V class and uh, any later post-war classes that might reflect updated technology and design standards. Related to that was the fact that due to being in the war for a couple of years longer um, and having stopped construction on all other ships apart from the King George V in terms of battleships, um, the British were very conscious that coming up to the end of World War II most of their battle fleet would have been severely worn out and probably in need of scrapping, um, whereas the Americans having joined later and having built the South Dakotas and Iowas uh, would come out of the war with a battleship force that was significantly newer and able to continue in operation for quite some time afterwards as the Iowa class obviously proved. Um, so if, it, if battleships were to have a future after World War II then Britain would need battleships that weren't so badly worn out and Vanguard would be a prime example of that. And finally, there was also, simple as it might sound for a battleship, but there was the role of fleet escort because 
Um, I remember at the time, we're still in an era when uh, things like guided missiles and such were very either very much in their infancy or not really thought about. Um, and they definitely weren't going to be uh, the kind of uh, small, compa relatively small compact units that we have these days. So there was nothing better for escorting the sort of the real wielders of power by the end of World War II, the carriers, than a battleship covered in anti-aircraft guns, because carriers just couldn't devote the same amount of deck space to AA firepower. And obviously, if you have the carrier having to defend itself, the enemy aircraft are already there, which is bad news. Um, so the idea of a fast ship capable of uh, supplying a vast amounts of anti-aircraft firepower as an escort to the carrier wing um, was definitely on everybody's mind. And related to that is the fact that, well, basically the Americans, as I said, already with the South Dakotas, North Carolinas, Iowas, they already had plenty of fast battleship escorts. Uh, one of the biggest reasons for Montana's cancellation was actually the fact she was just too slow to keep up with the carrier fleet. Um, whereas Vanguard wasn't, um, which was probably the deciding factor in what saved her to be constructed. And honestly, for a ship of her size and capabilities, I think Vanguard got a little bit of a short shrift. Um, if she'd had more of a sort of in and out of mothball situation like the Iowa class had, and a little bit of uh, clever thinking by the Royal Navy, I think she probably could have seen service for a lot, lot longer. Um, Maybe as long as the R class, maybe longer than that. Unfortunately, that also relies on the British government uh, thinking sensibly and clearly. And uh, yeah, if you're relying on the British government to make sensible and clear decisions, I have a few bridges to sell you. And no, before anyone says anything, that's not a comment on modern politics. That's just a comment on the British government pretty much since the year dot. Just remember this. Britain acquired an empire by accident in spite of the government. Then the government got involved. That's how incompetent our governments generally are. Andrew Cox asks, what was the rationale to keep Iron Duke after the London Treaty but scrap Tiger, which was potentially a far more useful unit? Was it simply that a battleship was held in more esteem than a battlecruiser, or was there some other reason? Basically, it came down to the fact that Tiger was, albeit a very nicely updated um, version of, but still a derivative of the Lion class, and the Lion class had proven themselves to have some fairly significant shortcomings in war, um, mostly around unfortunately an unfortunate tendency to explode. Now, albeit that that had technically been solved, they were still fairly under armoured, um, and between their lack of armour and the 13.5 inch guns compared with the 15 and 16 inch weapons that most of the fleets were toting after World War One, it just, it wasn't a competitive ship. I mean, yeah, okay, Renown and Repulse weren't exactly very well protected either, but at least they had 15 inch guns, so they could do a lot more damage a lot further out. And then, of course, you had Hood, whose armour and armament was contemporary with uh, battleships of the period. Now, Iron Duke, whilst it had the same 13.5 inch guns, it did have two more of them, and it had armour, and its speed was uh, sort of contemporaneous with the R class, so it could stick in the battle line. Um, yeah, long term, as a, a battle line unit, it probably wasn't uh, the world's greatest uh, thing to keep around, but compared with uh, Tiger, Tiger would have basically been a very big cruiser killer, and there would be no chance of it um, taking on modern capital ships. Iron Duke kind of might have stood a bit of a chance against some of the older stuff, uh, especially when you had the Americans keeping things like Arkansas around. The other thing to remember is that the Iron Duke was kept around with the rest of its class of four ships, whereas Tiger was a class of one, um, which would have made maintenance a lot harder, because in the immediate post-Washington Treaty naval environment, you had the Iron Dukes, the Queen Elizabeths, the R's, and Renown Repulse and Hood as the British fleet, and it was only when the King George V class um, were under construction that you started to see the Iron Dukes actually phased out. Napalm Ratter asks a couple of questions. He says, uh, looking at ships with just three turrets with twin guns, um, such as Repulse or the proposed upgrades to the Sharnhorst class, or other ships with three guns, Prince of Wales, Iowa, Sharnhorst, etc., how much effort would it have been to add a fourth turret in the back super firing or increase the amount of guns per turret? Um, 
Also, how efficient was the Rodney in design of weight saving versus armor gain and usability compared with other designs with a turret on the back? And uh, so, well, that's half his question, so let's answer those. We'll come back to the others some other time. So the Nelson class design, um, which obviously gave us HMS Rodney as well, um, it actually was relatively efficient. Um, we did I covered in the video on the G3 series um, why this and the N3 as well, uh, why this uh, kind of um, all guns up front design uh, was taken to shorten the Citadel and everything. And uh, basically, in those kind of terms, if you look at the uh, competitor designs of the period, you can see where the weight savings have gone. So if you look at the Colorado, Nagato and Nelson classes, they're all within sort of a few boxes of shells of the same displacement as each other. Now take a look at their armament, armor and speed. The Nelson, compared to the other two, gets an extra 16 inch gun in there and it's in three triple turrets as opposed to four twins. So there's a bit of extra firepower there already from the start. Now, all three ships have different speeds, but it's interesting to note that although the Nelson is not the fastest, Nagato is at 26, just over 26 knots, Nelson at 23 knots is still two knots faster than the Colorado at 21 knots, despite carrying that extra gun. Now, secondary batteries, you can't really make that much comparison um, because they all use different calibers of guns, and Nagato and Colorado carrying more, but lighter guns, and Nelson carrying... Uh, 12 6 inch weapons, so let's call that one a wash. Now we look at armor. Now Nagato has obviously sacrificed some armor, it's only got a 12 inch belt, in order to achieve its higher speed. So Nagato has fewer guns than Nelson and it is less well protected than Nelson in exchange for a 3 knot speed advantage. Um, so yeah, the, Nagato's not really going to stand up too well in a fight, although it could possibly run away. Now, both Colorado and Nelson have a similar general thickness of belt armor, albeit that Colorado's uh, thickens up to 16 inches over the machinery. However, Nelson's belt is inclined, um, which makes it significantly more effective, albeit that it obviously weighs a bit more because there's more physical armor to fit in. Now bear in mind that the slope of the Iowa's belt is very similar to the slope on the Nelson's belt, and the Iowa with a 12-inch belt supposedly is equivalent to a 17.3 inch belt out at 19,000 yards, i.e. Uh, sort of starting battle range. Now imagine the Nelson's belt, which is 13 to 14 inches thick to start with, at the same range it's actually going to have a fantastic amount of equivalent protection. And it's two knots faster than Colorado and it carries an extra gun. So yeah, that's where all the weight savings on Nelson, on the Nelson class went, uh, basically made them more effective fighting weapons. Now, the question on turrets comes down to uh, sort of two factors, and it's all to do with weight. So ships with uh, three twin gun turrets, it's basically just because that's the maximum they could get in on the ship for the other characteristics which they thought were important, which usually speed. Um, but yeah, there's obviously the standard design for a lot of uh, the battleship here was four twin gun turrets, and if you couldn't fit that in, you went with uh, three twins, and hopefully you had slightly bigger calibre guns. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's no way, Repulse and Renown were pretty big ships already, so there's no way you're going to get a fourth in without effectively just rebuilding the hood, um, which was kind of not the point. You've got to remember, each of these turrets is weighing sort of high hundreds to low thousands of tons, depending on the exact calibre and type of turret you're talking about, and then you've got the barbette, which is going to add even more, plus the magazines, even more, plus it's adding more uh, length on the ship that you need to protect with belt armour, which means you're going to have thinner belt armour for the same displacement, which makes you more vulnerable, etc, etc. Now, the other ships, the ships that had triples and quads, like uh, the King George V's, Iowa's, etc., um, the whole reason was that you could get more guns in uh, fewer turrets compared to the standard four twin, which gave you eight. Uh, three triples gave you nine. And then again, you had that advantage of shorter armor belt and uh, better concentration of fire, as long as you could design a half decent triple turret. With the size and weight of uh, guns going up the way they did in uh, World War II and the run up to it, basically, if you made a ship with four triple turrets, at full calibre naval uh, naval guns, you are going to end up with either an absolutely colossal ship, which would cost the Earth and you wouldn't be able to afford too many of them, or a slower ship. And uh, as it turned out, 
the Americans did obviously try that with Montana and then discovered that the speed was a much bigger issue than it had been in uh, the pre-World War II environment because now you had to deal with carriers and uh, carrier escort duties um, and that kind of was why they died a death. I mean, there's there's a lot more involved in uh, exactly what kind of gun and turret layout you use on a battleship, but that's about as much as I can go into without making the entire rest of the Dry Dock episode purely about gun turrets. So since we've been doing a bit better about answering questions quickly uh, in this particular episode of the Dry Dock, I won't go into quickfire mode, but we maybe we'll get two more questions in. Um, so, oh, gotta love this one. Sexual Tyrannosaurus asks... <laughs> um, why did the Royal Navy go with four 15-inch double-gun turrets for Vanguard instead of using three triples? It seems like three triples would have been the best saving weight and gaining an additional gun. Well, well, there you go. Ironically, that was me talking about mm, similar related subject in the previous question. Um, I swear I didn't so switch the page over and see that and decide to try and link the two together. But anyway, um, the answer is, well, yeah, you're right. Three triples would have been um, a better option and possibly would have meant even less redesign of the lion class hull because obviously the lion class were designed to take three triple 16s so putting uh, three triple 15s in and just calling it a day would have uh, meant you could stick a bit more weight in other areas armor anti-aircraft firepower etc would have been a good idea sure however the reason which you're looking for is that vanguard was basically a ship that they tried to get out as fast as possible and as I've mentioned in a number of other episodes, the guns for a ship are the single longest lead items. If you don't get the guns ordered before you've even ordered the ship, the chances are you're probably going to delay the completion of the ship. Um, and when they decided to try and throw together a battleship quickly, when they realized they weren't going to be able to finish the Lion class in time, or so they thought at the time, obviously any battleship they tried to throw together, they weren't going to be able to commission new guns. So they had to look around and go, well, do we have any old guns that we can use that are already built so we can just build the hull, stick some guns on it and call it a day? Um, and as it turned out, yes, they did. Uh, the only turrets they had lying around and guns they had lying around that were vaguely competitive in a World War II uh, environment were 15-inch 42 twin turrets uh, that had previously been used on Courageous and Glorious and they were effectively sort of the similar kind of turrets that you've got on the Queen Elizabeth, the R's and the Hood, um, albeit with a few differences here and there. Um, but they were there, so if you could complete a hull, you had the armament there ready to go. And they just went, OK, right, well, a few modifications, stick an extra barbette in, out goes the Vanguard's hull, grab these uh, turrets out of the uh, retirement pile, stick them on, put, pop the guns in, and there you go, HMS Vanguard. Um, the Americans tried to do a similar thing with the Iowa using the guns that had been left over from the Lexingtons and South Dakota 1920s, but as we covered in the video about the Iowa, uh, thanks to those wonderful bureaucratic uh, organizations that try and manage the US Navy, they screwed up and ended up having to build a brand new gun for it anyway. And so finally for this episode of The Dry Dock, Grev Gnu asks, um, I was wondering why most World War I era ships had multiple smaller smokestacks and in World War II era ships most had one single but larger smokestack. Well, this actually plays into a very complex set of circumstances that differentiate World War I and World War II era ships that most people don't realise, and that's all to do with the boilers. Now, obviously, the boilers of a ship are where the heat energy generated by the furnaces, whether they be coal or oil fired, is turned into steam which then drives the turbines and in most ships that then drives the propellers in other ships uh, it drives other things which then drive the propellers but anyway you get the idea now in world war one the boilers were what they call large tube boilers so stepping back again um, a ship's boiler is effectively a giant metal cylinder through which the water is placed uh, to heat up and turn into steam and the heat is conducted into the boiler. Now, you could, in theory, do it like a field kettle where you just heat the bottom up, um, but that's incredibly inefficient and wouldn't get you anywhere very fast. So uh, what they do is, if you've ever seen the open front of a railway engine, um, they run a series of tubes through the boiler, and then they run the hot air through those tubes. Or, alternatively, you can uh, run the water through the tubes and run the hot air around them. That doesn't make much odds, uh, whichever way you do it. But anyway, 
The point of the matter is that this tube interface vastly increases the surface area by which the heat is transferred to the water, so it's a lot more efficient and a lot faster. Now in World War I they could make tubes uh, down to a certain size, so this is why you had so-called large tube boilers, and bear in mind you are heating water and using uh, hot air that's got uh, contaminants in it, whether that's a stuff from seawater, uh, effectively limescale build up on a massive scale, or ash and such from the fires. Um, and smoke and other particulates, so you don't want them clogging up. So the tubes that they used were re relatively large, um, so you had fewer of them, and therefore you couldn't generate as much power per boiler because of the efficiency inherent in having these larger tubes. So that's World War One, and hopefully you understood all that. Um, being an engineer is trying to get a concept across, sometimes escapes me. Um, anyway, World War Two era, um, sort of mid-20s, mid-30s, the small tube boiler was developed, which, as the name suggests, had a lot, lot more smaller tubes, so the amount of surface area was dramatically increased, so you could heat a lot, uh, a lot more quickly, a lot more efficiently, and therefore you didn't need as many boilers to generate the same amount of steam uh, pressure. Now, this could lead to one of two things occurring. Either you ended up with uh, ship that you could replace all the large tube boilers with small tube boilers and then you'd have massively more power and you'd make your ship go a lot faster. However, obviously threats were evolving, equipment was evolving, more anti-aircraft batteries were needed, blah blah blah, all these other things that you see in all the uh, mid-war, uh, interwar period refits, so an awful lot of the time uh, the various nations went, well, you know what, if we can generate more power per boiler, and boilers weigh a lot, they take up a lot of space, why don't we install fewer boilers, replacing the more numerous, older, less efficient ones, and then we generate the same, or possibly slightly more power, and then we can use all this saved space and saved weight on other upgrades, like the aforementioned anti-aircraft guns, etc. And that meant that the engineering power plants of refitted and World War II vessels generally took up a lot less space than comparable uh, World War I vessels, and so you ended up with fewer smokestacks. Um, and that's why you see in uh, when you have these refits, quite often one or more uh, funnels are lost in exchange for a few bigger ones, because the engineering power plant is just concentrated that much uh, closer in. It would be interesting to see it would have been interesting to see, sorry, um, if one of the uh, World War One uh, refits done by a nation had just decided, you know what, screw it, we're going to put in the same number of boilers and just have hilarious amounts of power go charging around like a, a 35,000 ton destroyer. But alas, nobody did because they were far too sensible. But there you go. Um, so that brings us to the end of another Dry Dock episode. Thank you very much for listening. I um, hope you have enjoyed it. Uh, shout out to the patrons who are hearing this 24 hours ahead of time. And uh, thank you very much. We will see you again on the next episode of the Dry Dock or the specials or the guides, whichever one you happen to be watching. Thank you very much and good day, night, whatever time it is over, wherever you are.